Today, we have our speaker today is Professor Nancy Amato from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah. Sort of. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> and she'll be talking about sampling-based motion planning from intelligent care to crowd simulation to protein folding. Okay, Professor Amato is the head of the Department of, of Computer Science of her university and has a long list of achievements and uh, important positions, projects, which I'm not going to read because it's too long, it would, would take half of the talk. So I'll let her talk directly to us. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for um, inviting me here. Um, it's my first time to Brazil and I'm really um, having a great time uh, seeing different parts of the country. Dilma has been taking us around and I guess this is our last stop. Um, so Let's see, I'm going to move this out of the way, I think. So today what I want to talk to you about is a technique that originally arose for robotic motion planning and which now we can apply to many different types of motion planning problems. And I'll start off by first kind of describing, let's see, I have to turn this on. There we go. What is motion planning and what do we mean by it? In the most general sense, you have a movable object. In this um, example here on the left, the movable object is this, just this stick, and you want to move it from the first you know, area to the second area in that environment. And you need to do that while avoiding collision with the walls. And so the job of the motion planner is to design, to determine the sequence of valid configurations to take it from the start to the goal configuration. I have. Um, What's shown there is this alpha puzzle. This is a what's known as one of the benchmark planning problems for motion planning. You've probably seen it and played with it. I'll pass it around. Um, if you know this particular configuration, that's the, the secret. Once you do that, you can separate the tubes or put them back together. But you can imagine if you were trying to design an algorithm to figure out how to do this on its own, that set of configurations that are this special configuration, it's a very small set. And to have the algorithm figure that out on its own is a very challenging problem. So that's why this is known as um, this benchmark problem. I can let you pass it around. I, I warn you, if you take it apart, it's, it's, you have to kind of have the same trick to put it back together. I, I won't even try. Oh, you can try. <laughs> I'll help you if you get stuck. I've done it before. <laughs> so um, now I'm going to take you and give you just a bunch of examples of different hard, challenging motion planning problems. The first ones here are um, these two characters. One is a baby, a model of a baby, and the other is a model of a robot. And we have actually determined the skeleton, which you can see inside those, um, the bodies, automatically. And then we've applied some data from an actual box or to both of these. But there's you know, just a lot of motions and a lot of things to keep track of when you're moving them together. Oops, trying to get them all started. Yeah. You point it towards the computer, maybe? No, it's, it's my, I'm going to use the mouse over here. This will work. I have to find my mouse. It shows up over there. OK, so these things should get started now. So down here on the lower right is an, a robot, a manipulator, and it's trying to move and grasp the binders, pick them up and put them in the bin. And so you have to plan for the arm to avoid collision, get the gripper around the binder, grip the blind binder, pick it up, put it in the bin. The, the most challenging problem on this page is actually that lamp on the upper part there because there's three chains that have to move together that are coordinated and you have to plan them all to move together so that you can move the lamp through that opening there. The soccer ball or football up on the top, that's actually one of the easier problems on this page, even though it has a slide, even though it has more parts, but there are not other constraints on the, the different motions. On this slide, what we have is a deformable body. So this teapot and the ducky, they're actually following the same path, but they're deforming to avoid collision with those two balls that are around them. 
you can see above that how we've done that. We've actually planned the motion for a, a cube, really, to go through, and, and we plan for it to be deformed, and then we apply the deformation for the cube to whatever the object that's inside the cube. This is an example that uh, has been used from like computer animation or motion pictures, Pixar, those kind of you know, animations. But the same kind of problems appear also for surgical planning. You can imagine if you have a needle, it's called a flexible needle, and you need to put it, insert it into a patient and get the end point of that needle to a particular place to deliver some medicine. While you're doing that, you it's a flexible needle, and you need to deform the needle so it'll avoid going through an important organ or something like that. So it's a similar type of problem. One of the things here is you can imagine there's essentially an infinite number of different ways you could deform those objects that you're deforming, and so you need to figure out how to do that in whatever is a safe or valid way for, for that problem. You separated it. Good. So here, this is a set of problems that comes from computer-aided design. They both come from, the models that we have here are from GE, um, and they come from aircraft engines. In both cases, they are examples where if we had had a motion planner that was integrated into the CAD system, the engineer would have been able to, and they would have been able to do something better than they ended up doing. In this case, they designed the parts separately. They knew they were possible to be put together, you know, to be together in their um, assembled configuration, but they didn't know if it was possible to insert one into the other because they didn't know if they could make that turn that's happening there. After we applied the, our motion planning algorithm to that, they figured out that it would have been possible, but this was years later and they had already did, you know, tr thrown this out and decided to go with some other design. The other one is a part of an aircraft and the circled part is a part that they need to be able to replace relatively easily. And you can see that there are these um, pipes that are bent a little bit. The engineer did that because they thought that the way that they would replace that part is they thought they would rotate it and pull it out. It turned out with the motion planner, we were able to see show that it was possible to actually move, remove the part without that. So they would not have needed to have those pipes bent. And so that would have been actually a better design with having just the straight pipes. But these were both examples where they they weren't able to go with a better design because they didn't have this planning algorithm integrated into their CAD system. And other um, useful things for having a planner like this integrated with a CAD system would be for training. You could show in like an augmented reality environment to like a mechanic what should be the part removal path for something rather than like usually they show these sch schematics that are showing many different layers of, of how to move things or how to assemble things. So having these things together with uh, you know, manuals would be very useful. So far, all the examples we saw had just one movable object. We can also have planning problems where we have many different agents. Multi-robot problems where you have multiple robots that need to work together. Um, what we have down here is another animation. This, this, the large agent is trying to herd those five smaller ducky agents into that corral. Those agents, um, the small ones, they are just um, following standard flocking behaviors, if you know what that is. They try to stay together, and they're trying to avoid the shepherd, but they don't have any concept of where they should be in the environment. The shepherd is the one who knows where he'd like to push the other agents. Let's see if these will start. Yes, okay. So these other examples, the, that first one up here on the upper right, that's a disassembly problem. Similar to the ones for the Intelligent CAD, there we have sub-assemblies that we can take apart the sub-assemblies and then take them apart. Once we figure out how to do disassembly, you can actually reverse the problem and put it back together. That's how you would solve the assembly problem. The one on the upper right there, that is um, a simulation, a multi-agent sim simulation that we developed with some colleagues in the School of Architecture. They were interested in using multi-agent planning to study building usage and, for example, like how people, how long it would take people to exit in a, a building. You could use this for evacuation planning or just to, to look at, you know, building usage patterns. Another application we looked at there was for um, designing hospitals, for example, and they wanted to have uh, design buildings that would support healthy living, encourage the hospital staff to work, to walk more, for example. This last example is a little bit different. So far, in all the examples we saw, 
the validity of the um, situation was we were simply looking for whether or not there was collision or collision free. In these biomolecule examples, we're looking actually for low energy conformations of the biomolecules. That's what makes them a valid conformation. In the ones on the bottom, the protein folding and the RNA folding, there were, I'll talk about protein folding a little bit more later, but there we're looking to see how the biomolecule can assemble its native state, which is a state which is useful for it. The one on the top right, the drug design, that's a little bit easier to see how that's a motion planning problem. In that case, the drug molecule, the, the green molecule, that's a smaller molecule, and we're looking to see how we can get it to fit into the binding site, which is a, a pocket typically on the surface of the large molecule, molecule which is a protein, which is once it binds, that's how the reaction that uh, occurs. So one of the amazing things, all those examples I've shown you so far, we have solved with the exact same algorithm. And the way we do that is we transform the problem first in using this abstraction called configuration space, and we design algorithms in configuration space. And then we can take any planning problem we want, once we can transform it into configuration space, we can use all these algorithms that many people have developed that work in configuration space. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to explain to you a little bit about configuration space, what it is and how it works, and then I'll talk, explain a few of the different algorithms that we've um, developed in our group using configuration space. So first off, let me ask you, how many of you are familiar with the configuration space concept? Okay, good. Okay. So you're going to learn something that's pretty, you know, I think... At one sense, it's, it's pretty simple and intuitive, but on other, another sense, it's um, really um, kind of really deep um, and challenging. Hopefully, we'll all manage to get through the, the simple elegant part. That's the part I like. So in this space, the robot, our movable object, maps to a point in some higher dimensional space. And some, I have some examples across the bottom here. So if... A, Pretend that my robot is itself just a point in three-dimensional space. That means the workspace and the configuration space are actually going to be the same. Once you know the x, y, and z coordinates of the point, you know where that robot is in your space. Now let's go to one that's a little bit trickier. Um, let's say you have a rigid body in, in three-dimensional space. Let's say it's this, this marker. If I tell you the x, y, and z coordinates of a, any point on this you don't actually know where the pin is. There's many different configurations of the pin where I fix this point right here. So in fact, knowing the x, y, and z coordinates of one point, I need additional three values, these orientation values, to know what the pin looks like. So that means just for any rigid body in three-dimensional space, we would have a six-dimensional configuration space for it. The next example, um, this planar manipulator, imagine it's in the plane of the screen here, and the things that I can control are those three um, angles, the alpha, beta, and gamma. Once I set those three angles, you know what that manipulator looks like. Okay? The last one is a protein model. When we model a protein, so a protein is basically a string of amino acids, and for each amino acid, a common convention in biochemistry is to model it using two values what are known as phi psi angles. They tell you somehow the orientation of some of the, the, um, the atoms in that amino acid. And so if a, I have, a, let's say, a relatively small protein might have 50 amino acids. Each one of them has these two values. So that means that small protein would have a 100-dimensional space. But once I set all those phi psi angles for each of those 50 amino acids, I have this point, which is a 100-dimensional point, but that tells me what that protein would look like, that conformation of that protein. Okay, any questions on configuration space? Okay, so the next thing we need to think about is whether or not a point in my configuration space is actually valid. So if, for example, if I'm the robot, I can only show you valid configurations of myself. But there are um, configurations of me where, let's say, my arm would be through this desk. There would be many configurations where I would be in collision with this desk. So what, that, what we can do then is we can have a configuration space <laughs> obstacle that corresponds to this desk. That's all the points in configuration space where I would be in collision with the desk. I could also have points where I would be in collision with this laptop. 
And I can similarly make a configuration space obstacle that corresponds to a laptop. There would be some configurations where I would be simultaneously in collision with the laptop and the desk. So that would be a point that would be inside both of those configuration space obstacles. Okay? So that's basically all we need to know about configuration space. We can now think about how can we do planning in configuration space. So here's a simple example. On the left, in the workspace, my robot is a triangle. And the workspace is that, rec that square. And I have four rectangular obstacles. The robot configuration space is going to have three dimensions. X, Y coordinates for one point on the triangle. And then every different orientation of the triangle corresponds to basically one of the, the dimensions, you know, the levels in that theta space on the right. Okay, so now this shows us one of the bad things about configuration space is I started off with these really simple, nice rectangular obstacles in the workspace, and each one of them got transformed into this more complicated obstacle in configuration space. That's the kind of the one unpleasant thing about this transformation to move from the workspace to the configuration space. But the nice thing is, is that every time when I'm doing the, the plan, the path for my robot in configuration space, it's always going to be a one dimensional path in the configuration space because my robot's always a point. And it's just a sequence of points that avoids collision with my configuration space obstacles. So all those problems that we saw early on, in order for us to think about them and transform them into this configuration space problem, we need to think about what are the values that I need to set to know what my robot configuration is. If it's a mobile robot, it's probably an XY coordinate of one point of the robot, and then maybe a heading so I know which direction it's facing. So that could be a three-dimensional configuration space for a really simple mobile. For a robotic manipulator, I just need to set the angles for each joint of it. Okay? Yep, that's all right. Okay, so one of the unfortunate things is that what happens with most any problem we want to solve, it's really hard. And it turns out the very best deterministic algorithm that we have for solving the motion planning problem was developed by um, John Canney in his PhD thesis back in 1986. And it can really only be applied to problems that have four or five dimensions. So that means like if I have you know, my, my rigid body in three space, remember it had six dimensions. So we can't even really use this algorithm on that simple problem. So what do we do? What we do what we always have to do. Um, we don't give up because we still want to solve the problem, and so we often turn to something called randomization or probabilistic methods. And that's what we do here too. And basically what we do is we trade off our guarantee that our planner will always solve the problem for us exactly with a method that's going to often solve the problem for us well and much faster. So there are essentially two different types of these methods. One is what are called multi-query methods, where we build up a map of our environment in advance, and then we can use it many times to plan. Let's say I'm going to have a mobile robot working in this building. In that case, it would make sense for me to, to, to map the, build, the building well, and then I can use it any time I want to, to select a path for my robot. The other um, type of flavor of these methods are things that you just we use them for single use. So I have, I'm just now going to do one particular um, task for my robot in this building once, so there's no point in me mapping the entire building. I only need to explore the part that I need for actually that one task. I'm going to talk to you about how to solve these multi-query methods. The same, same types of primitive operations can be applied and used to solve the single query methods. So here's how it works. This method was developed independently by two groups, um, and then they later on um, wrote a joint journal article, and so that's what we um, cite here. So this is not my work. Again, this is uh, the original method for the sampling-based planners, and it's a roadmap-based methods. What they do during the pre-processing is they first generate many um, robot configurations at random. The original methods did them uniformly at random, 
And for each um, configuration they sampled, they tested it for validity, typically testing if it was collision-free or not. And so in this case, they would retain all the blue samples, the valid samples, and they would discard all the red ones. Then, after we do that, for each sample that I retained independently, I would pick some small number, fixed number, usually 5, 10, maybe up to 25 of these other nearby configurations, and I would try to connect them. So in this case, I would try to connect um, this point to this one, this one, this one, and this one. And what, when we say try to connect it, we would use some simple deterministic method to try to make that connection. It should work really fast. I'm not requiring it that it can be complete. Typically, they would just look at the straight line and they would test for um, validity all the intermediate points on that straight line. If they were all valid, they would keep the edge, those three blue ones. And if any one of them was invalid, they would discard the edge. Now, note the one that's dotted red here. It is possible to move from that point to that point. But this simple method that I tried didn't discover that, so I'm not going to have it in my roadmap. I do that for all of my points independently, and I end up with this roadmap that should contain, hopefully, if it's a good one, representative feasible trajectories in this space. Now, if I have a query that I actually want to solve, I have my start and goal configurations. And for each one of those, I want to connect those to my roadmap using the same strategy I just did. And then I can use my favorite graph search technique to pull out the shortest path connecting those two points in the roadmap. And note that this path is not the shortest path. It's not the best path. It's just some path connecting the start and the goal configuration. And that's what we were looking for. We weren't asking it to get us the shortest path or the best path. We were asking it for a path. Okay, now this method, when it was originally developed, it was very revolutionary. It was, um, it enabled us to apply motion planning algorithms quite easily to very high dimensional problems. A robotic manipulator, say, with many de degrees of freedom. And we could support um, queries very quickly if we had done good enough pre-processing. And so there were many success stories where the probabilistic roadmap methods were able to solve problems that, frankly, we just couldn't solve before. However, probably some of you have already been thinking about some cases where you think this method might not work. And that's basically how I got into working on to this um, problem. I read the paper that described this method, and I had some ideas. I thought this was really silly, and there's some cases where it wouldn't work. And here's an example of a case where it doesn't work very well. Because original methods did this uniform sampling. And if, if I want to move from like the lower left to the upper right in, in this problem here, I need to have my roadmap be connected through all the areas. But some of these areas are very narrow. And my probability, in order to have my roadmap go through those, I need to have samples in those regions. I don't know what those regions are. I don't actually have access to those configuration space obstacles. So I'm just uniformly generating samples, and the chance that they're going to fall in a narrow region is very small. The chance where they're going to fall, in most cases, is the easy region. So, easy region. so if I was sampling in this room, I would get my samples in this area here where it's open, maybe in the pathways. I'm not going to get it between the chairs, right, where it's tight. That's where it's actually planning is harder. And in fact, this problem is called the narrow passage problem. All those problems I showed you at the beginning of this talk, those all have are some form of the narrow passage problem. And those were problems that this type of basic strategy didn't work very well on. And that's where what the work of my group has focused for the past like 20 years really working on these problems. So let me give you kind of a flavor of how this works. So we just look through this and we see that most of our samples show up where we don't want them. What we'd really like is we'd have to like to have our samples near, be near those sea obstacle surfaces. But remember, the, the complexity of constructing those sea configuration space obstacles is very high. And in fact, we can't afford to construct them. We don't have a construction of them. So how can we sample on their surfaces without knowing them? That's really the challenge that we have. And so what we were doing here um, is we were trying to think, what can we do? So it turns out, in some cases, we actually did have the, 
the workspace description of the obstacles, right? We weren't using that when we were just using uniform sampling. And that's the idea of this method, which I'll explain to you now. It turns out it works pretty simply. And what we do here to, to solve this problem is we start off with a point that's in collision. So if I'm the robot, a point where I'm in collision with the desk. Now we pick a direction at random in the configuration space. If I find a point in that direction, now that's free, now I'm actually home free. It's very easy for me to now find a point near the surface. What I do is I just do a bisection search. I generate a, the midpoint. So now I know that there's a surface crosses someplace between points two and three. So I do it again. Now I know that the surface will be someplace between points three and four. I do it again. And in this case, I would stop because I decide myself when I have come to the proper resolution where I have a point near the surface. Now there's a few things about this that are kind of you know, unsatisfying. For example, you see that this ray intersects the surface in many points. I have no idea how many times it's going to intersect the surface. All I know is that there's at least one and I found one of them. So we weren't able to know anything, for example, about the distribution of the points I got on the surface, so I don't know that I covered it well. Maybe there's a passage that I missed. None of these things could I say from this. But it turned out that this method worked pretty well. Um, in fact, and it's um, still used by many people today. Um, and after we came up with that method, my group and many other groups essentially kind of spouted a whole new industry of developing what we call bias sampling methods. Methods that would somehow try to guide the sampling in such a way that would be useful for whatever problem you're, you're trying to solve. So now let me just kind of give you a few other examples to give you an idea. So one of those things I just mentioned is it was annoying to me that for many years, I would say almost 20 years, I wanted to have a sampling strategy where I could know that I had sampled nicely on the surface. And I didn't know how to do that. So that's the question we're trying to answer. Can we generate samples uniformly on a surface without knowing where it is? Seems like a hard problem, right? It turns out we can actually do this. Um, the way we do this, instead of sampling just individual points, I sample small fixed length segments in my space. And for each segment, I'm, I am going to study it exhaustively and find out all the points where that segment intersected a surface. And it turns out we can prove that those points will be uniformly distributed on the surfaces in my space. Now there's a few kind of um, less than ideal things about this. Once I have this segment, and I want to find all the points that it intersects, that means I have to check every single point on the segment. So that's a lot more expensive than just sampling a single point. And if I have segments that are really short, then I'll have to sample a lot more of them to get nice coverage. So the longer this, the segment, the higher the probability is that it is going to intersect something, but the more expensive it is to check. The shorter the segment, it's kind of um, converging towards a point, so it'll be cheaper to check, but it'll serve, you know, I'll have to have a lot more of them in order to get that coverage nicely. But this was a very, you know, nice, um, satisfying result to show that we could actually do this. And so if there is a problem where you really do care and it's very important that you cover the surface nicely, you could use this strategy. So likely, if you were going to use it, you'd probably just use it in some small region of your space, not overall. Another question. So the narrow passage. Remember, that's the problem. That's the space that it's hard for us to generate samples in. And many of the problems that we cared about <coughs> had that characteristic. This twisted nail puzzle that's going around, that's a narrow passage problem. That one where we had the tube going into one and another, that's also a narrow passage problem. So here's a question, can we reduce the dependence of the volume of the space, for example, that narrowness of the passage, on our sampling density? Can I make it so that I don't have to sample many, 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 many samples just to ensure that I cover the narrow passage? So here's, here's a problem, a strategy that kind of moves us in that direction. It doesn't entirely solve the problem for us yet. But the two examples we have here kind of illustrate the cases that it's hard for us to, to tell the difference between. Um, when I'm mapping these spaces, I don't really know whether or not I'm in this scenario where there's in fact no passage 
to move from the top to the bottom, or if I'm in this one where there is a narrow passage. How can we determine that using these methods? Well, um, here's the idea that we came up with. Instead of just mapping the free space, let's map at the same time, simult simultaneously, both the free space and the block space. And now they do look different, right? This one here, there's still the two connected components on the top and the bottom, and now I have a left and a right component in my block space. Over here, I have just one component in my block space. Now what happens, at some point when I'm building these maps, I'm going to try to connect from one of these connected components in the block space to the other connected component in the block space. And that connection is going to fail, right? Because it's actually going to cross the free space. When it fails, what happens? I've actually found a point in my narrow passage. That's one of those important hard points to find. So it turns out by just making this simple you know, switch of mapping both the free and the block space, which we can actually do, right? Our, our, we have all the same operations. We can really do this at the same time. This will give us these important points. So you can imagine um, trying to apply this. And here's a simple um, uh, scenario where we applied it in these uh, three different passages that are just, they're identical except for the narrowness is, is, is smaller. So this is the first one, the second one, the third one. In all three cases, we tried to sample um, a thousand points, and what's shown here in red are the number of those 1,000 points that showed up in the narrow passage using this strategy called toggle PRM. And you can see, yes, they were decreasing, but we still ended up with about a third of our samples in the narrow region when we were using our toggle PRM strategy versus, let's look at the uniform one, the green one. That's the, the original one. Down here we have, you know, one if we're lucky in there. So this worked um, quite nicely. Now, the planar example that I've shown you is, is nice and intuitive and you can see how it works. But if we even step up just to three dimensions, it's not quite so simple because you could imagine this narrow region in three dimensions. If it's a plane and it cuts the whole space, it'll work the same way. But if it's not a plane and it's just a, you know, a, a small tunnel, that separation of the space is not so um, obvious. So there we came up with a different type of uh, criteria which we called local separability that allowed us to apply this. This is still, I think, you know, a nice project for a, a new student to try to help us figure out how we can do this because it's, if we can figure out how to apply this generally in all dimensions, it will really be a breakthrough because it will impact the efficiency. It will mean that we can solve all these problems really quickly. Right now, you know, we really are, the efficiency depends on the, the difficulty of the problem. In this two-dimensional case, we have already find a, found a space where it's actually not. The efficiency is the same for an easy and a hard problem. So we want to be able to kind of lift that up to higher dimensions and still work there. Okay, so now I want to give you a couple um, example applications that, you know, of how we've, of things that we can apply these algorithms to. The first one here, this is a problem, that tube that we looked at at the beginning. Now this is an interesting case that always kind of bothered me because as myself, I look at that, you look at that, you know what the characteristics of that removal path are like. It's just going to be something like this. Now that you know how this planner works, you can see that if I ask the planner, if I just give it this problem and ask it to solve it, it's going to be really hard for it. It has no idea that that trajectory should roughly look like that, and so it just starts from scratch. So imagine if instead what we did is we could have some human or somebody else, you know, sketch the trajectory and pass it off to the planner. And what if it's not exactly correct yet, but it's close? And so in a situation like this, I would ask my planner now, give it this red path, some approximate path, and ask it to fix it. This is a lot easier for problem for the planner because now you've restricted the space for it to search and you've asked it to, if you've given it something that's close enough to correct, it should be easier for it to correct it. So what does it have to do here? It just has to identify this invalid portion and we could use even that obstacle-based method and kind of push it out to the surface and get a correct one. We did this using a haptic input device. 
I don't know, how many of you know what a haptic device is? A couple. So it's a virtual reality device that can let you have force feedback back. And so it's, the one we used is, you can kind of see it up here, it's a little pin type interface. You can imagine attaching that in the, you know, virtually to one of the things that you're moving around and it will give you some feedback but in order to do it really fast enough for it to be correct, we can't actually even handle that today. So you could roughly let yourself sketch a, a trajectory using that. So here's some results we had with this for this problem here. We had three different versions of the problem. The one is the original version. 0.95 means we shrunk that original tomb to 95% of its original size. That's the one up here. And 0.85 was 85%. So that was actually a pretty easy problem here. And we were able to solve that using our fully automatic method. It took us about 500 seconds to solve that using our obstacle-based PRM method. But it took us just a few seconds for our planner to fix up the trajectory that was sketched by the human user. The 0.95 one is, is interesting. What we did there, if we collected the path, um, our, our automatic method would have eventually solved it, but we were impatient and didn't wait. But the red one here took it about 3,000 seconds to correct the path that was collected by a user. But it took just a few seconds to take, we took the, the valid path for the 0.85 version and use that as input to the 0.95 version. And that's the one that was solved fastest. And in fact, that's how we solved the original version of the problem. We took the valid solution for the 0.95 version of the problem and gave that as input to the original one. Now this works well in certain types of problems like this one where you can actually look at it and we have an idea what the solution would look like. But for example, in that alpha puzzle that we're passing around, that, you know, it's, we can't really envision that configuration space. We don't know how to sketch the trajectory. It's hard and we can't really do that. So this type of strategy won't work for that. Okay, so now the last thing I want to do is give you a little intuition about how this we can apply this method to the protein folding problem. So if you've heard of protein folding, that's not the problem we're solving. Protein folding usually refers to someone gives you the sequence of the amino acids and you want to predict the native three-dimensional structure of the protein. The reason we want to do that because that three-dimensional structure of the protein is often related to its function and it can give us a clue about what the protein does. But there are also many diseases, for example, that are related to the misfolding of a protein. And so understanding how a protein might fold and how it might misfold, what might be the, portion, the regions in the folding pathway which are you know, more or less stable, being able to study those kind of things would be very interesting to biochemists. And that's a problem that we are studying. That's also really important to study, to have good computational techniques because it's hard to actually get an image of what's happening with a protein folding experimentally. So, um, the folding landscape. This is something, so remember protein I mentioned earlier has a different configuration of the protein would have an energy. Now the lowest energy, the most stable configuration of a protein is its lowest energy state. And other, ener other conformations of the protein where it's uh, you know, configured differently have higher energies. And most um, proteins have this kind of, you can imagine, a funnel type structure of their energy landscape. So that if you're closer to the native state, the stable conformation, it'll be closer down. Now the shape of these folding landscapes impacts the way the protein folds. If the shape is steep and, and um, smooth, the protein could fold very quickly. If it's less steep, you know, you know kind of uh, more like this one here, and it has these little ridges, the protein could spend some time in local minima before it reaches its, its native state, and so the folding process might take longer. So the bottom line is different proteins have different landscapes and different folding behaviors. And so what we wanted to do was use our method to help us come up with an approximate map of these folding landscapes and see if we could then extract different characteristics of those landscapes to tell them something about the protein and how it might fold. And we basically use pretty much the same way I explained to you the method before. In this case, one thing that's different, we start off knowing what the native structure is, and that's our lowest energy state, and then we iteratively perturb the protein 
um, configuration. In each one of those new configurations, we can evaluate its energy using standard energy evaluation techniques, and we have these different points. Then we do this same thing of trying to connect the nearby, nearby configurations. One difference that we do here is for each of the um, uh, edges, we want to give it a weight that would, there are weighted edges and directed edges, and we want to give the weight so that it reflects the feasibility of that transition happening. So for example, if the protein moving from one configuration to another on the edge was kind of all downhill, that would be a very favorable transition because it's always getting a lower energy. Other times, maybe it goes up, and so that would have a little bit higher weight. So what this allows us to do, though, is we have now this map with all these weights on these edges, and we can use our favorite graph search techniques to extract full di these different trajectories and evaluate them. Now, one of the big you know, challenges for these type of methods would be validation. How do I... You, we could see that we could do this, but how can we convince the biochemists that this has any relation to reality? So, luckily, they have studied a lot of different proteins, and there was this one in particular that was really well suited for us. There's this protein called protein G. It's a pretty small protein. It has an in, uh, central alpha helix and then two of these other things, which they call beta hairpins. And this group, David Bader, Baker's group up in the University of Washington, had made two mutants of this protein. They changed a few of the amino acids, and basically what it did is it modified the order in which those beta hairpins formed. So those two proteins are, or three proteins are almost all the same, except for they actually have different folding behavior. So this was a perfect system for us to study. We built the maps for protein G and its two mutants, new G1 and new G2, and then we extracted all these folding pathways and we saw what order those hairpins formed. And it was really pretty amazing to us and, and our collaborators that it worked really, really well. Um, virtually all the pathways that we pulled out actually had the hairpins forming in the order in which we knew that they did experimentally in these different proteins. So doing that um, allowed us to kind of get the attention of, the, of our biological you know, collaborators and they're interested in, the, in you know, doing more with us in our, our method. So this is basically all I wanted to tell you about this method. Um, Hopefully you're now like as intrigued by it that I was when I first learned about it. Um, I'm still intrigued by it today. And there's a ton of different applications that we can apply it to that I haven't even mentioned here. And I keep learning about new ones. Every year or two I have a, a new, you know, amazing one. Um, the most recent one that we are now applying it to is teeth. So straightening teeth. Teeth are movable objects. And you can imagine that you have your teeth in a certain configuration and they're crooked. And you go to the orthodontist, and they give you, they either put braces on you, or now they give you these other things that your teeth, you know, move, you know, every few weeks they give you a new one. So, what are this? This is basically a motion planning problem, right? Each one of those is an intermediate configuration, and we're working with some orthodontists um, to try to come up with a planning problem for that. So there's a lot more things that I haven't actually told you about this, but, you know, hopefully I've whetted your appetite so that you want to, to learn more. And I also have to thank the people that actually did all this work, which were my students and some of my colleagues. Um, many of them are my former students that are now off doing their own things. Many of them are professors or in, at research labs. Um, and I have a few stu students, too, that are keep going, and I'm building a new group now at the University of Illinois. Um, oh, I didn't mention, I have one student. I've had the high school students even work with me. And one of them, that toggle PRM method, he was the first one that worked with me. He's the most famous member of my group. He won this science competition in the whole United States. And he got to, he, this is a picture of him in Times Square. And that's a picture of him on the Times Square reader board because, you know, he was up there because he won this, you know, science competition for high schoolers. Um, so any questions about this kind of work? Questions? Hey, uh, did you try to apply on, on the selection of points to try to apply a discrete set of points and then select uh, the uh, random points like high density lattices or? Yeah, in fact, um, some I haven't done that. Um, we did look into that. 
Some people have done this, they're, they're quasi-random sampling type strategies, I think you're talking about. One of the things to think about, think about the, in some cases this will work pretty well, especially if you were really don't have that high of a dimension. That would probably work pretty well up to maybe five, six, seven dimensions. But imagine like in a hundred dimensional space. It would be just so sparse to actually have a strategy like that work. So we can't really do anything that's really anything like a lattice in, in the very high dimensions. Sometimes, though, you might want to do this in a particular area where you might know that you are working in a lower dimensional subspace for this particular region. So kind of like a local planning type of strategy. But very good question. Thank you. More questions? Uh, I have a question, but before that I wanted to announce after the, the presentation is over, uh, three professors here will stay with us and chat about possibilities of collaboration with their respective universities. So those who are interested, please stay afterwards too. Okay? Yeah, and I uh, have a few slides to tell yeah. you about the University of okay. Illinois too. Uh, now, my question is just uh, curiosity. You showed this last example with uh, uh, proteins, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. I mean, uh, how many amino acids do they have? Um, now I've forgotten. This one is about 60. 60. 60. Can you give us an idea of how much time it took the processing? So th that's kind of an interesting question. So one of the nice things about this R method is you can spend as much time as you'd like. Okay. <laughs> right. So the for this method, well, you do a few samples, right? It's not a very good coverage. You can do that. So the the one that we did here, we did it twice, um, in two different ways. One we used, a, and the time is not only the number of samples because the time will also depend on what energy function you use. That validity test. So we did it two different ways. We did it with a really simple energy function that you know most people wouldn't use in like a real biochemist would not use that. Um, the one that we were working with did. And then we also used what's called an all atoms um, energy function. And the, that adds two orders of magnitude if you just change the, the, the energy validation to the, all, the one that looks at every single atom. So in our less, of, you know, our coarser one, we spent two hours processing. Um, in the other one, we spent, you know, days. <laughs> But we got the same results. That was the other amazing thing. So it was a little bit finer. So the, what here shown here are the ones where it was a few days processing. Um, the results were, you know, 97 and 98 instead of 99 and 98 when we used the course one. The Van der Waals force plus the, the, how you say, the, the change uh, you have come across. You, you consider this kind of problem? I think, you, are you talking about like the case where the protein itself moves? Yes, with two proteins, because we have the pathway, you have the, the connected you know, the, the proteins, and they are falling and falling. This is a big issue. No? Yeah, so we, so you're, I think you're talking about where we have like protein-protein interactions. Yes, yes. So that's like a much bigger problem. That's a, the protein ligand binding that we are, we have studied is like a baby version of that problem. Uh, what, one of the, we are working on that. I don't have nice results yet, I will say. But it's, uh, it's a tricky to do that because you have different, um, the, actually the thing that's really anno the, uh, challenging to us is not our method. It's the energy function because once you have two different proteins, you have each one has their own energy function. Now I have to this complex, and we don't really know what to do with that. It's, it's more complex because you, in the cells you have many proteins. Yeah. And they are. Uh, yeah, our body has plenty of proteins. You say crow, crow is protein. You have many in the ocean. Yeah. No, it's. We're looking at a really small, you know, simplified version of the problem, for sure. More questions? Uh, can't, you, can't you just 
uh, enlarge the number of nerd, nodes to improve your precision, like affinity element simulation. For the to to hide uh, the density of the, your node. We could, right? But one of our challenge that just takes longer, right? So um, we would like to solve these problems so that we can use them. Ideally, in some cases, we want to use them in real time. So for example, these methods are used for self-driving cars. And while your car is moving, you want it to, it needs to give you, you know, essentially real time solutions. So we can't always do more sampling. Um, that is, you know, we should, you know, so we want to minimize that, but sometimes you can't avoid it. We just do have to do more. But if you could, yes, you could solve that. Um, nice. Um, I want to ask about teeth. Teeth. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it was, I'm sorry, um, I could not arrive from the beginning, but I was uh, very intrigued about uh, the tooth problem, maybe because I have moving teeth. But, uh, and I have no. We all of, have moving teeth. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but mine move more than others. <laughs> so, uh, um, I don't have a feeling for protein, but of course I have a, a feeling for, for teeth and, well, they, they constrain each other, right? Yep. So it's, it's a system that kind of moves together. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, how different would it be to, to model that kind of system uh, to that one? I mean, because I have no feeling for proteins. And um, I keep thinking of, you have moving objects, but they all move together to the left or the right sometimes. Limited degrees of freedom, yeah. but together, right? So for teeth, I can't, I can't share everything, yeah. but um, some of the things that we're doing, for example, your teeth, you have this arch that your jaw has, right? And the teeth are constrained to, they can't like move out of it unless you pull a tooth out, right? Then it's difficult to put it back. But, um, so we have a constraint about where they can move. And as you mentioned, sometimes they're very tight to each other. So they, it, I can't just move them independently. I have to move them as a unit. So I think you did come after, but um, some of the, the people that were here earlier, when I was showing the assembly problems where we had these sub-assemblies where we take out a set of parts together and then we move them. So we could do, we would do similar things with teeth, like so we would identify, you know, several teeth that are kind of fixed together, and then you apply forces to them to move them. So there, there are a lot, in fact, it somehow makes the problem a lot easier, right, because you, you have a lot of constraints that are, you know, constraining your motions. And uh, I'm sorry, it's just as you were showing things, I thought about flocks of birds moving and exactly. animals and, yes. and whatever. And um, uh, would that also be able to to model? Exactly, yes. And so do you it can have formation at the subset and at the whole group. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Kind yeah. of hierarchy? Yeah. Or? Yes. You, can ha you have formations that you want to maintain. You may identify you know, particular agents that have more, you know, leadership priorities, for example. Once you, in the, in like the flocking situation, it, it's a little bit easier than the teeth, right? Because you, you know, have some more degrees of freedom. Yeah. But it's a, a similar, yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're oh, you're yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and it is stupid, right? Because I, I work with this. But the first time... So we work together, and the way it works is that the workflow of go doing consultant comes to me to approve. So the first time that I saw this 3M for dental uh, motion planning, I didn't think about orthodontics. What I thought was about removing how to uh, remove when you have to extract a yeah, tooth yeah. without causing so much pain. But, so that was what I thought you were doing until I attended your talk one of your talks. So does it also make sense to apply for ways of removing body or, I think you'll talk about the needle one, yeah, yeah. But, but so, but, the, but 3M was not interested in making my extraction less painful or anything <laughs> like that. Not this group, at least. Right, and, and, and also for implants, the little that I know about implants is that uh, they also have some motion once you put the, the pin 
and the pin yeah. has to fuse with the jaw. There is also that depending mm -hmm. the way they move or not during the three months. So I thought that there was a lot of uh, much more only the orthodontist. Yeah. Maybe, it may be, yeah, maybe your consulting will continue <laughs> for a while. Okay, well, I would like to thank again uh, Dr. Uh, Amato for a very interesting talk. Okay. Thank you. Can I show you okay. a few slides about the uh, University now, of Illinois? Yeah. As I yeah. said already, Professor Amato, Professor no, Dilma, me. and Professor Lawrence Rauchberger okay, will stay here and chat with those who are interested in possibilities of Interchange. Hmm? Yeah, but that's well, that's part of this chat. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. But if they're interested in visiting sure. Illinois or or Quem quiser ficar à vontade. So I should take this off now. <laughs> Só porque eu. Se você quiser, eu vou parar. Pode parar.